Hello, I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's presentation. The Dole Institute Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings and assist in events like this one. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoyed today's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. Before we begin today, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the presentation, we will have some time for audience question and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please just ask one brief question. <laughs> and now, please welcome Associate Director of the Dole Institute, Barbara Ballard. Good afternoon, and again, welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. Today's an exciting day for us, and you know we're celebrating our 10th anniversary series, and of course, uh, this is very special. On this 10th anniversary, the Dole Leadership Prize, and I want you to know that Senator Dole is very pleased uh, with our award, as he is with all of them. We'll be honoring President Nelson Mandela and we will have the pleasure of hearing from his son, Lavoyo Mandela, who will be accepting his award and is very accomplished on his own, so he's carrying on the Mandela uh, legacy in his own way. But before I get into his introduction, I just want you to look on the back and let you know that we're having our civic engagement and KU Leadership Week, and it ends on October the 31st, and we've been doing a lot of voter registration because we know, again, that's an important component of democracy and your civic responsibility here in our country. Also, we'll look at uh, our program with the world of Richard Ben Kramer. And for those of you who know more about it, I'm sure you would like to come and continue learning more. And those that don't, this will be an opportunity with Mark Swansaker to find out more about that as well. We have the Fort Lemworth series, a very popular series. For those of you who have been there, you know it is, and we hold it in the Simons Room. And again, you'll be talking about at home and abroad, selected topics on World War II, whirlwinds of flame, the strategic bombing of Japan in World War II, and then our Student Advisory Board program. And, and as you know, we're very proud of our Student Advisory Board members. Our students work really hard on our behalf, giving you their greetings, making sure you are welcomed when you come in, and also they have their own committees going, but they get the opportunity to choose programs that they would like to present. And they have one on Eyes on the East, China's Changing Media, Youth and Global Influence. And of course, our annual Veterans Gala. Everyone is invited to that. We have Moonlight Serenade Orchestra playing. This part of the Hanson Hall becomes the dance floor, and if you don't want to dance, you can sit and listen. And then if you don't want to do that, you can eat and you can drink. And then if you don't want to do that, I don't know what you want to do. So I would just invite you to please take an opportunity to come and celebrate our veterans. They give their lives, their time, and their service for us, and that's one way we can say thank you. Now I'd just like to introduce Lavoyo, and it's a real pleasure. We had the opportunity to have dinner with him last night, learned a lot about him. And whenever we look at some of our young people and what are they doing, it's not necessarily following in the footsteps of someone before them, but what footsteps are they creating and what path are they making for themselves? And they take all the history and everything they've done with them in that process. This program is being co-sponsored by the KU model United Nations. Uh, Global and International Studies Club. And we had a brunch this afternoon, and I think our students enjoyed Lavoyo as well. You all know that Nelson Mandela is widely accepted as one of the world's most significant leaders. You know how he suffered. You know he was imprisoned. You know that sometimes we have a price to pay for what we believe. And if we stand by what we believe, it is not always easy. And I think President Mandela proved that 
If you believe it, you have to live it, you have to do it, and if you want to liberate the people in your country, there's lots of things you have to do, and there's a lot of pain and suffering in the process. He fought for justice through political action, and he became South Africa's first president. Lavoyo Mandela is the great-grandson of, Man of Nelson Mandela, and uh, he's a social entrepreneur working for Chiyam Tusi uh, Service, and he's a lead consultant. We also know that he's putting his learnings from the broad-based black economic empowerment industry, and he's applying them to develop reliable, manageable, and sustainable interventions that enhance corporate social enrichment and responsibilities. He is an ambassador for Cheese Kids for Humanity. And perhaps Bill will ask him what Cheese Kids stand for because those of us who are at the brunch will laugh when you, you know more about Cheese Kids um, along that. Uh, he's driven by his passion for development. He has spent the past few years in a variety of areas within the industry. He has enjoyed experiences both in the front and the back offices learning and gaining holistic understanding of business operations and its, and its needs. While employed as a verification analyst, he even got his hands dirty and spent some time verifying and auditing uh, the compliance contribution of a number of South African businesses. He's been involved with the broad-based black economic empowerment industry. And that's going to help make a lot of changes as far as South Africa is concerned. I would also say to you, he has a sense of humor. He understands what the Mandela name means. He has been in the United States before. He has actually been here since October the 14th. By the time he leaves, all total, he would have given over nine different presentations, workshops, and a whole combination of things on behalf of his job as well as Mandela's Memory Center. He's a graduate of Hamilton College in upstate New York. And he told us an interesting story whenever he would tell some of his friends in South Africa that he was going to college and it was in New York. They go, oh yeah, they think in New York City. He said, nope, <laughs> <laughs> upstate New York. And he enjoyed it because it was a small college and he had an opportunity to do a lot of things and to learn a lot. With that, I'll simply tell you that the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory is very similar to the Dole Institute of Politics, very similar to what a presidential library uh, would be. And uh, the Memory Center's work is very similar to what we do here in terms of archival materials and public programming. I think you will enjoy this afternoon and I think you will leave here knowing already that President Mel Nelson Mandela certainly deserves this award, but you will also leave here knowing a little bit more, if you didn't know it at all, about his great-grandson and the work he is doing carrying on that legacy, but also you'll be introduced to a very fine young man. May I turn this program over to Bill Lacey and a warm round of applause for La Lu <laughs> La Buyo Mandela. Thank you. La Buyo, welcome to the U University of Kansas, the thank Dole Institute. Glad to have you here. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for making the time to come in and join in the conversation. Now, let's start with your story. Everybody's going to want to know your story. So, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your education. Um, before I get started, I'd like to greet everyone as we would do at home. I am fluent in three of the um, 11 official languages at home, English being one of them. And generally when we greet people, we'd say Molueni, which is Isikosa, which means good morning. Or alternatively, it's San Bonani, which is um, I see you in Isizulu. But I'm told that in, at KU, you greet people by saying chalk rock. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, hello. I'm, <laughs> I'm from Durban, South Africa, born and raised, and I was in South Africa for about 17 years, and strangely enough, it was one of the things that almost clicked for me as I was coming over from the airport over to the Eldridge Hotel, 
is um, I got a basketball opportunity to come and study in the U.S. at St. Anne's Belfield in Charlottesville, Virginia. And uh, coincidentally, I was driving towards the first institution to employ Dr. Naismith, who was the um, founder and um, inventor of the wonderful sport that I now love. So for me, that was also another connection. So I had an opportunity to go study at St. Anne's Belfield. And this was in 2003, where I did my grade 11 and 12 year. And then from there, carried on to Hamilton College, where I then studied and majored in philosophy and an emphasis on ethics. And I wrote my final thesis on transformation in South Africa, which then led to me working in the broad-based black economic empowerment industry and doing the so the broad-based black economic empowerment is the South African policy for affirmative action. And what it does is it measures the corporate environment to see how transformed it is in um, mirroring the demographic of South Africa. So black is considered non-white South African. So that's Indian colored African as in myself and also the uh, Chinese community that is growing in South Africa. So did those audits. And in fact, I joined the organization to do their sales account and marketing management and um, had carried on that responsibility for about two and a half years. Then took a little break from, from um, NERA, which is the name of the company, National Empowerment Rating Agency. And throughout the time, it was almost a crash course. Um, I was explaining to, to Bill and the guests y yesterday evening that I fell in love with an idea of using education as a platform for youth development and one of the questions was, how did I come up with the idea? And it was during washing a car when I had graduated from, from Hamilton. And it was re recapping on the experiences that I'd had, on the, on, I'd had during the previous six years. And more than anything else, it was the realization that I had um, interviews that were coming up the, the following months. And the thought dawned on me that I actually don't want to go into the interviews and I actually don't want to work. But what I would like to do is to create a platform and an opportunity for others to get the opportunity that I got through um, education. So that's also one of the projects that I'm working on in a personal capacity. And um, as Dr. Ballard had spoken about, I'm also involved with Kiatumzi Advisory, which then helps organizations. So in, this, in the space where I was doing the auditing, I had gotten a lot of insights. Um, from organizations that wanted to participate in transformation, but some of them didn't know exactly how. They either didn't have the, the manpower in-house or the opportunity for them to engage the legislation. So I started an advisory company that, um, through my learnings that I had gotten from doing the audits, could advise them how best to engage the, plat um, the transformation agenda and also make sure that it's sustainable and makes business sense for them as organizations. So Yatum's Advisory does that, but I focus, we focus primarily on enterprise development and socioeconomic development, which are two of the seven pillars that are measured against. And enterprise development then allows a corporate to engage with um, black entrepreneurs in South Africa and help them develop. And, and the socioeconomic development then works with um, qualifying organizations that, charitable organizations that benefit the um, non-white community in South Africa. So those are the two focuses, but I, we do then um, engage companies on the holistic transformation of the organizations. So the, the education platform that I'm currently working on and um, excited to be registering it by the end of this year will be called Skew Circle, which is a play on the, the term, which is we all come full circle. And it's a recognition that while we all come full circle, our journeys will never be the same. And it's an understanding that creating a platform that gives those um, young South Africans and kids from the equivalent to the inner cities in the US, but it's townships in South Africa, giving them a platform through education to become global citizens and globally competitive. So those are the two things that I'm busy with in my personal capacity. And um, as of this year, I think this would be the, the second opportunity that I get to hone in on another skill that I've developed in, of recent, which is being a glorified courier where I go travel, I see great places and collect <laughs> awards and get to send them back home. So <laughs> it's been a good year. <laughs> uh, uh, tell us, uh, Barbara wanted you to talk a little bit about Cheese Kids, I think. Oh, yes. Um, Cheese Kids is an organization that, so in South Africa you have, um, 
the um, imbalance that's been created about apartheid, that's been created through apartheid. You have those that have and those that don't have, and um, some of us that are born of families that would put us in a position of privilege. And Shaga Sisulu, who's of the um, Sisulu family, grandson to Walter and Albertina Sisulu, um, started an organization. Well, he started first by getting his group of friends, close group of friends, to go to neighboring communities, the townships that I was mentioning, and do Habitat for Humanity builds. And what he found is that it felt great for the kids that um, they were saying, well, I am of privilege and there's very little I can do about my pri privilege. And instead of being put in a space where um, you're made to feel shameful about it, own it and use that platform to do good. So when he was going over to the neighboring communities for Cheese Kids, a lot of the kids from the community would feel like, oh, look at these privileged kids that come spend a few hours do a little bit of good, pat themselves on the back, and go back to their comfortable homes. So instead of shying away from that name, he then decided to own it and call it Choose Cheese Kids for Humanity. Because the idea is to get young people who um, live comfortable lives, engaging communities and people who are less fortunate than they are, and doing the bit that they can to help uh, neighboring communities. It's since grown into an organization that allows anyone, and in fact it always did, to participate. And it, what it does is it allows for a very exciting, fun, and easy to do platform for volunteerism and giving back and community service. So that's what Cheese Kids for Humanities is. Okay, let's talk about your great grandfather. Uh, talk a little bit about how President Mandela's uh, upbringing and education prepared him for what he was to do later in life. My great grandfather, um, our family is part of the Temple people, and um, he. Our role is within the Temple Kingdom, we are considered chiefs. And one of our responsibilities, so there's the main house that will give um, rise to the heir of the throne of the kingdom of the Tembus. There's the right hand house that then um, will almost play the role of being acting, acting chief or acting king if for any reason there isn't any um, heirs to the throne. And then there's the left hand house which is um, the house that me and my, our family come from. And what we were responsible for doing is counseling any disputes there were between the right hand and the main house. Um, these are called Inju Inkulu, Inju Yagunene, and Inju Yasekosha, which is the big house, the main house, the right hand house, and the left hand house. And that was the role that my great grandfather was um, meant to take on. And growing up, he was always, and he tells, he used to tell a lot of these stories about sitting just in a, um, a space where it's called Ipunga, where the elders get together and they get to share ideas and it's a, it's a council. And in fact, he'll speak about the, his traditional role in watching his elders in the traditional environment almost groomed him for democracy because in order for anything to be passed, it would be tabled to the group, and it would be thrashed around through um, rigorous debate, and only the solutions that stood up to the debate and allowed for a consensus to be reached would be the ones that are implemented. So from that environment, he then also um, got much of the training that allowed him to be the uh, democratic and collaborative person that he's known to be today. And also during his, um, so then, he went to school in Fort Hare, which is one of the schools. During the apartheid system, what they had done is they had, of course, apartheid means to keep apart, and they used to have um, institutions that would be for the white communities, and depending on which of the, um, they call them Bantustans, which of the regions you had come from, there would be an, an, a higher education um, institution within your region. The one that he had gone to because he was from the Eastern Cape was Fort Hare, and that's where a lot of the ANC um, leaders of his generation would then, they started gathering and started engaging pol politics and um, the, the social movement of the ANC, but he got more heavily involved when he had then graduated and moved to Johannesburg where he started working. And he started noticing how a lot of the people that had come from the rural areas going to the urban centers were living. And that's how he got more heavily involved in the ANC. But what you learn from, well, we learned from hearing stories and them retelling what they used to go through with their peers is again, it was a lot of them and uh, something that also came up in the conversation was 
the dinner last night was that a lot of the, some of the leaders were social workers, nurses, and teachers. And you'd have with um, that, those professions people who pay great attention to detail. So my great-grandfather was trained as a lawyer. Um, Mr. Walter Sisulu was a teacher himself. So you have these people engaging in a lot of the debate and a lot of the conversation that was happening. And um, that was the experience that they had as part of the ANC, and which is the African National, Co African National Congress, excuse me. And then, of course, we know that they were arrested during the Ravonia trial, but that robust debate and robust engagement continued while they were in prison. And they used to, <laughs> they used to play Scrabble. And while in prison, there's a, a gentleman named Mr. Mac Maharaj, who's now currently the public speaker for, uh, the spokesman for the presidency. But the joke is with uh, Mr. Mac Maharaj while they were playing Scrabble is that you could either have words that came from two dictionaries, either the Oxford dis Dictionary or the Maharaj um, <laughs> Dictionary, because the words that he would put together, a lot of them would question um, <laughs> the authenticity of the words and the spelling that he had come up with. So those are little anecdotes that they generally um, would share whenever they engage in platforms. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. Uh, spend a little more time, though, talking about uh, the president's uh, time in prison. It was a very lengthy time in two or three different facilities. Yes. Um, a story that Mr. Ahmad Kathrada recently shared at a One Young World Summit um, was along the lines of how apartheid even continued within the jailing system. So apartheid was, again, keep apart, and what it did is it then created a hierarchy of races within the South African community. And what it did was you had the white community, which were, in fact, you had with, even within the white community, you had the Afrikaners that were considered the top, and they were the, generally the members of the National Party. Then you had the... Um, English-speaking white people in South Africa that were considered second to, um, second to the Afrikaans community. Then you had the Indian community, and after the Indian community came the colored community, and then of course at the bottom was the black community. Now even in prison with uh, Mr. Ahmad Kathrada, he's of the in descendant of the Indian community. And even in prison, when, <laughs> when they would give him the clothing, um, of course, when you clothe young boys, you clothe them in shorts. Now, uh, Mr. Ahmed Kathrada shares a story that, well, the, the fact that my great-grandfather is 10 to 15 years his senior, and there he was, someone he considered a leader, watching him have to wear shorts throughout the time while he was in prison, throughout the imprisonment. And that was just how they had consistently tried to reinforce the whole structure of um, the hierarchy within in what was considered to be part of the um, apartheid um, regime. And the interesting things um, that he'll share is, so he went into prison when he was 46 years old. And while he was in, for in prison, he picked up a new language, which was Afrikaans. And he also added another degree while he was in um, prison through the University of Witzvaterstrand. He somehow negotiated and convinced the, um, the wardens and the the people in the, the jailing system that he could get a degree and study through correspondence. But the most fascinating thing that he shares about his learning of Afrikaans was that it allowed him to engage with his, his jail guard. And through speaking with his jail guard and gaining, gaining a better command of the language, he then taught himself how to read. Um, Afrikaans, and the way that he taught himself how to read Afrikaans was by reading the, the letters that were actually sent to his um, jail guard, because unfortunately the man couldn't read. And that's how he learned and got better at Afrikaans and um, ended up with quite a strong command of the language. In fact, when he um, was released, he, <laughs> he would read a whole host of newspapers just to make sure that he understands what's going on in, in the country. And I think just being locked up for 27 years, you, you thirst for any um, current events and any current information. So he had either early in the morning or in the afternoon when he was done with his day just before dinner, you knew not to interrupt him because he was reading his papers when you came back home. And he also would be reading the Afrikaans, which is a, a field newspaper. 
So, um, yeah, that was just something that he had picked up while in prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the clerk became state president, yes. released your great-grandfather, and, and entered negotiations with him to, uh, to end apartheid and uh, to change the government. How, what transpired from there? Um, so during the negotiations, which, when, which then led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC, but they, their collaboration and their engaging back and forth won them both, and they shared a Nobel Peace Prize from that actual engagement between um, former President F.W. de Klerk and my great-grandfather. But from, from then onward, that transition, and it's something that we were talking about at the, the SAB brunch, is that there is a feeling that somewhat in South Africa people say, well, well done, great, you were able to broker a, relatively speaking, a very peaceful transition from apartheid into the democracy that we have now. But there's some people in the community that feel that too many concessions were made in terms of how South Africa would be run. So our neighboring country, um, Zimbabwe, has a whole nationalization of a lot of the minerals and, bless you, a lot of the minerals and um, resources that we have in the nation and there's a lot of argument that says, given the space that they were in during the, um, that negotiation period, too much was given away. And that's something that a lot of us young South Africans are engaged in a, quite some conversation about whether or not that was the great decision, but it's our responsibility now to bring it closer to um, allowing a lot more people to participate and a responsible redistribution of um, advantages, platforms, and overall the, the wealth. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, his decision to run for president, his first election, and what that, <laughs> in fact, he what have people told you that was like? Uh, he didn't want to run for president initially, and it came from the council that said, well, you were part of the, you were part of the negotiation space, and he had identified a number of other people that he thought were better suited to lead than he was. And um, finally, uh, after, m I guess, a barrage of battering from his um, constituency within the ANC, he took on the, pr the, the leadership role. But he's also one of the presidents that stepped down before the end of his term. And that was, I think, his gesture to say, going forward, um, many leaders must be in the space where they must serve their purpose within their role. But if you yourself as a leader feel that you've done all that you can, then you can start spending the remainder of your time in office mentoring the next person, which um, the next president, president of South Africa became Thabo Mbeki, and he served two terms himself. So that was something that was also, um, I guess, different in, in his time of leadership and something that he himself as saying, um, I, I, I guess I was right, I wasn't best suited, and here's someone else that you can start, you can start grooming, and he, then he became more of a ceremonial head towards the, the later end of his presidency and continued grooming and making sure that um, the, the president that would succeed him would be um, Thabo mm -hmm. yeah. What would you say were his most important accomplishments as president? <laughs> He always tells the story of the fact that we as a family come from Mbezo, which is a small rural community in the Eastern Cape. And the message he tries to run home whenever we're engaging with one another is that anyone can play their part, anyone can play their role, and it's less to do with where he came from, but rather the company that he kept and the type of engagements and um, conversations and debates that they would have and only when you look around in a room of people where you engage and you trust and you have faith in them that you think that maybe they either have as much faith in you or alternatively you don't see someone that maybe is as good a leader as you are, do you step up to the plaque and then take on the leadership role. Um, he always shares the space that leadership wasn't anything he, ch he actively pursued. 
he just happened to find himself in a lot of the environments and um, would, would rise up to the task at hand. I asked him once, um, there's a famous saying when he speaks during the Ravonia trial that he realized, um, excuse me, <coughs> when he realized that they were going to be sentenced to death with the death penalty. And he then makes the statement that um, freedom and liberation and equality for all is a right that he believes in. And of course, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's a value that he believes in. And if need be, it's a value that he would die for and is much prepared to do so. So Reese, and this was probably three years ago, we were engaging and just, just chatting after work. And I asked him, were you aware of what you were saying, and he, he was very quiet, and then his response was, at some point with the engagement with his peers, they were very aware that they were going to be sentenced to death for what they stood for. But he, at some point, realized that if he continued to fight for their individual freedom and not make it a political statement, then they would, of course, be um, sentenced to death. And it was when he changed and made that statement of saying, it's actually not even about us that are currently on trial during the Ravonia trial. It's more of a value that we collectively stand for. And I myself, as Nelson Khorikla Mandela, it's a value that I'm prepared to die for. And in making that statement, he was able to change it to be less about the people that were on the Ravonia trial and more about a value that they were representing on behalf of a bigger community, which was the rest of the South African community that was li living under oppression. And it was in making that statement that um, I think was, was the game changer and also always sharing that what sometimes unfortunately happens in South Africa in retelling the stories about the struggle for liberation, it's always black as in black, um, me, African. And what he tells is a story about a Greek or king who, um, so the colored community that's spoken about in South Africa, um, they're generally traced to being descendants of either the Greek or community or the Bushman community in terms of the, the local tribes. And he always speaks of the fact that there was a Greek or king who after his whole community and his kingdom had been massacred, he was the last standing man on a cliff. And the um, and he had fought valiantly, and the conquerors then extended him a peace branch to say, you fought valiantly, we cannot afford to completely massacre this community. And his response and retort to that was, well, you've killed all my people. What kind of king would I be to save my own life when all my people are no longer? And he fired his last bow and flung himself onto the cliff. Now, this was a story that my great-grandfather would tell many times when we'd come to visit and... Um, I say come to visit because I grew up in Durban, which is another city, or come over for dinner. And he'd always tell us to remind us that in and as much as a lot of the material that we consume about our history books speaks of Africans being the first to resist, as in black Africans, um, we weren't the only ones. And in fact, there are many stories and retellings that speak to other people who were resisting against um, colonialism and um, which then led to, specifically in South Africa, the, the, the institution of apartheid. So I think from that perspective, also always making sure that people aren't left out in telling the story about how South Africa became the nation that it is today, and always speaking to the inclusive nature of anything that you want to do in making it sustainable and ongoing. So it had originally started the ANC as primarily an African organization, but over time it started including some of the colored community, the Indian community, and which was evident in the meeting and the signing of the Freedom Charter, where it was representation and collaboration with a lot of the other communities and other political parties that said, when we get our freedom, what do you want it to represent and what do you want to be the document that then um, sets in stone what we as a general community um, believe in and the values we hold dear. I'm curious, and, uh, and of course, I, I don't, if I'm doing my math right, you weren't alive when he was elected president. I was eight years old. Oh, you were? Yes. Okay. Okay. <coughs> what reaction was there in the country when he was elected president? And, and what stories have you heard from him 
or some of his colleagues or your family, just the way people reacted to that. That was such a huge change. It was. Um, reaction when I was eight years old, I had no clue, to be honest. <laughs> 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 anything, anything that I engage about what was happening during 1994 and the first few years of his presidency is material that I'll hear from other people and that I seek out actively. So uh, I'm currently reading his conversations with myself and have been engaging some of the material about his time in jail and what was going on. But it ran, it, it ran the spectrum. So you'd have people who were ecstatic and others that didn't quite like um, the space, but majority was very happy that he had been elected president and it was, um, I think as is the case with the election of President Barack Obama, there are people who are very, um, very much in support of his election and there are others who aren't. So I think relatively speaking and comparatively speaking, it would be the same in South Africa and at home. Um, one thing that, so I had a friend when I was in primary school, which would be the equivalent to um, elementary school. And every day after school, I would go over to his, to his home and um, spend a little time do some homework and get to kill some time before my mother came to pick me up. And the one time I was like, why don't you come over to my place? And we had to just walk over to my place. And during the walk, and this speaks to your question in terms of the reaction, he was a, he's a white, he is, I, don't, I haven't been in contact with him since and you'll understand why when I finish telling the story. But on the walk home, I think we were both in the second grade, so seven, six, seven, eight years old. And so we had, through the election of my great-grandfather, a lot more communities were then open to people who can afford to live in the communities. And my mother and aunt and my cousin and I were fortunate enough to be able to move into a suburban community called Westville. So we were walking from my then primary school over to my home in Westville and kids talking, going back and forth. And <clears throat> his name was Anthony. Anthony goes and says, oh, so you live in Westville? I'm like, yes, yes I do. How long have you been living? And at that point we had just moved in for about a year. And the conversation kept going and then he said, oh, there's more and more black people moving into the suburbs. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess. And his then question was, well, question and comment was, I think you should tell your, your grandfather to tell him to go back where they came from. And that goes to speak in terms of the impressions that they had. So it was, again, that, that space where you're engaging with people and in and as long as you're in their home and um, they're in their comfort space, then they welcome you. But the moment they are having to engage and they feel like their environment and their space is being infringed upon, then it's that whole, um, we don't want to be engaging too much with you. And strangely enough, I knew there was something wrong with that comment, but it didn't lead to anything. And then my, when we got back home, my mother kept on asking, so what did you guys talk about? And something in me told me, do not tell her <laughs> 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 what, what, you, what we were talking about. And then um, Anthony spent the night and then went out. Um, he, he left the next day. And... Strangely enough, it's a conversation that my mother then revisited. It's like, no, really, that couldn't have been, because I mentioned sports, I mentioned this, that, and the other. And finally, she kept on asking, what were you talking about? And finally, I shared the story. Needless to say, I was no longer allowed to be friends with Anthony or allowed to go over to his home. But um, in hindsight, uh, it, at first, I was very angry at my mom, because, I mean, Anthony was a cool kid. And other than that ridiculous comment, um, we got along quite well, and in hindsight, I mean, you can understand from a single parent's perspective, seemingly the danger that your child is in every time you go and visit, if that's the type of mindset that the parents have, because it wasn't Anthony that was um, holding those views, it was more the parents and the conversation that he'd been he ha hearing whenever the, um, the okay black people were over at his house. So there was a fair amount, and to some extent it still continues today that that goes on whereby um, transition from apartheid to current day South Africa where the interaction across races is um, somewhat superficial and functional. So in the work environment, we're great. We can name the number of um, white counterparts that we speak with and vice versa. 
but it's also a question of, well, how many do you engage with in your personal capacity? How many are you inviting over to have a braai? And not from a counting perspective, but rather, are you actually friends or are you colleagues? And it's fine if you're just colleagues, but be honest with yourself and say, well, I have colleagues, we get along, we'll have um, a drink or two after work on a Friday, but in our personal spaces, we don't really engage. And that's something that we as South Africans um, need to work on and are currently engaging. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we talked about um, was how a lot of people were disappointed when the president resigned because there were still so many problems facing the country. Yes. T t tell, tell that story that you were telling us last night. Um, okay, you'll have the, the financial, all the financial problems that the country faced. Oh, um, so in, in, in res one thing that my great grandfather was fairly decent at was raising funds to help South Africa in his global travels. And the economy came to a good space and it's one of the reasons why um, President Sabombegi was identified as a successor because he um, was educated at the, the, in England, I believe it's the London School of um, Economics. So there was an understanding that he's an economist, he understands the, the work environment. And a lot of people were concern from a perspective of saying, well, you still have some years, why don't you continue with the job and give people the impression that we're, we still have everything under control and can still um, run with um, the presidency under your stewardship and your, your leadership. And that was a, a, a major concern in, in his resigning because people didn't know anything about the rest of the leadership outside of my great-grandfather on the public and global space. And I think it was partially his um, speaking to the fact that he at least was very comfortable handing over the reins so the world must also um, start getting comfortable and familiar with a country that's not led by him and also being comfortable with a, a, a country that has the ability to, to raise new leaders. So that there was initial concern, but then his involvement um, <laughs> I was reading Sir Richard Branson's um, Losing My Virginity. And in the later part of the book, he talks about South Africa's, um, South Africa had a, a health and fitness chain called Health and Racket. And it was one, and this is another thing, speaking to my great grandfather being good at twisting people's arms and making sure that they invest. And he calls up uh, Sir Branson and says, well, I need your help with uh, one of our brands because it's going under. And we'd like you to do um, some financial investment as your virgin brand in South Africa in helping. Mr. Sir Branson's response was initially, well, health and fitness is not my thing. I do airlines, I do music, don't know that I can help you in that. And um, as reality would have it, my great-grandfather was able to twist his arm and the argument that he put forward was saying the health and fitness environment was a big employer of a lot of um, African people in South Africa, so it going under would create a almost a pressure cooker by a lot of people losing their jobs. So initially it was um, Sir Branson solving a problem and helping with um, take away the almost inevitable space of the pressure cooker of those people then being unemployed. And luckily for him, it was a great business decision because it's one of his quickest growing brands, the Virgin, uh, Virgin Active brand, at least in South Africa and a variety of the different countries that he's um, been involved in with the health and fitness environment. So again, it's um, something that can come of business viability from initially looking for a social impact. So thank you to him. And I, I need to go to gym when I get back from all the dinners I'm going to take. Okay. Uh, what will uh, Madiba's legacy be? Hmm. It's a question that we're, we're generally asked. And I think from, I mean, up front with, with him and the engagement that we have as family, he's never been one to say, this is what I did, you therefore have to follow suit. It's always been, this is what my circumstances and what was available to me, this is what I rose and became. He, at least in my personal space, um, <laughs> he's always 
encouraged us to try what we want to try, but make sure that we work hard to be the best, if not mentioned amongst the best at whatever we get involved in. And I think personally as a family, it's us, each of us, finding out what we are good at, what our passions are, and devoting ourselves to those passions and making sure that we dive into it. I think from a legacy perspective and an umbrella um, conversation, his would be one of um, service. Um, I should have actually brought this with me. There's a, a quote of his that says, and paraphrasing once more, as leaders and, and members of community, we generally speak to achieving greatness in education, the business environment, and, create and to be considered social leaders, but um, the values such as humility, humility sincerity, um, goodness of spirit, and also the readiness to serve others is um, more intimate and personal goals that are worth um, achieving and worth um, fighting for and are very easily be easily reachable for um, the human soul. And I think that would be something that he and his generation had stood for, which is a readiness to serve others. And I, the great part of it is that our generation does it well. We can do it without having to risk our lives. So from that perspective, um, engaging in a lot of environments and engaging in a lot of activities that allow us to serve others will go a long way. And I, it's something that in engaging with him and a variety of different mentors that I have is if we as us in this room, people my generation and younger, can do what it is that we're good at doing, but at some point look to positively affect our sphere of influence, if each of us can try and touch five people's lives will be a good way at helping change the world for the better. So it's also recognizing that it has, and that's something that sometimes almost paralyzes people and puts them in a situation where they feel like the, the problem is too big for anyone to engage. But if you look to impact your personal space for the better than in each of us and convincing others to do the same, then it's um, helping eat away at that perspective. And I think one of the reasons with that I'm wearing the, the, the pin that I'm wearing right now is that it's a South African initiative that's called Play Your Part. And it's about getting South Africans to play their part. So if you're great at, I don't know, accounting and you want to help an NGO get their books in place, NGO and people who start running those type organizations are good at what the organization's ethos and agenda is, not necessarily at the admin perspective. So if you can apply your trade as an accountant, which maybe that NGO or that environment isn't something that you're good at, but if you can apply your skill set and help them get their books in order or help them with the feasibility plan, that's you playing your part in giving back. So the conversation is always generally people will <coughs> create a, an either or, a false di dichotomy in saying is it either I go for the corporate environment or I go for the social environment. And the truth of the matter is you go for what you're good at. And in being good at that, you can afford to spend a number of hours training or mentoring a number of people, something that's, um, that I actually read on Twitter while I was uh, in the US is that there's an organization that's trying to get corporate CEOs to mentor headmasters of high schools. Now that learning of saying I'm a successful businessman and this is how I become a successful businessman and mentoring someone who's um, either running a successful school or alternatively running a school that's not doing that well, that interaction in terms of um, values, principles, and just general routine of how I go about my day and how I plan forward um, generally helps because you'll find a lot of people that are trying to do good and trying to do some change are in a constant case of crisis management and they're not in a, an environment where they can plan forward. And finding someone who can mentor them and saying, well, this is how I plan my day and this is how I end up planning forward, then it allows them to kind of calm the waters and get to where they want to be as an organization. Mm -hmm. You were very, as we talked, you were very young when uh, he was elected president. When did, when did it most dramatically dawn on you that he was a global hero and an icon? Because <laughs> he was just, he was your great grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> um, it happened in stages. The first one was when I think I may have been six years old and 
For some reason, I remember that it was a Wednesday, but I generally had a 7.30. Me and my cousin had a 7.30 curfew. Not a curfew, but sleep time. And this, this particular Wednesday, my mother said, well, get into the car, we're going on a road trip. And I thought, wow, I get to stay up late, so this is quite great. Hop into the car and we drive into the city, and I think my great-grandfather was in town for one of, um, I don't know what engagement it was, but he was in town for something important. And um, we get taken to a hotel, and then I go into the hotel, so first time staying up late, first time in a hotel, first time in an elevator, we get, go up to um, the room, first time in an elevator, and when we walk out to the room that he was in, here's this man standing with a bunch of people that are in suits and looking all serious around him, and he reaches out and says, hi, I'm your great-grandfather, and for some reason, I also remember that he gave me 50 rands, which was a lot of money back then. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me 50 rands, uh, me, my cousin and I. And I remember thinking, I only see this in the movies where someone is surrounded by bodyguards, so this guy must be pretty cool. Um, so that was the first memory. And the second one is when we had, so in the long walk to freedom, there's a picture where the family is on a lawn in Cape Town. And that was the first time the family had actually gotten an opportunity to get together as the whole family. Um, as many of you know, my great-grandfather was married three times. So first to Evelyn Masse, second to um, Winnie Matigizela, now Winnie Matigizela Mandela, and now currently married to uh, Mrs. Grasa Michelle. And back then, we were hopping onto the blue train. So again, first time on a train and getting to go um, spend the weekend with my great-grandfather. But the thing that was most exciting was, as young kids, we, we think it's the greatest thing to try to get away with missing out on school, and you shouldn't ever, what I'm about to say, you should never do. Don't try it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so what then happened is I had faked a stomach ache, I had faked tooth aches, I had come up with any other story to try to get out of going to school. And this particular Monday, my mother then, out of the blue, hey, you're going to miss out um, on two days of school. Let them know that you're not going to be at school on, on Thursday and Friday. And I was like, but why? And how is this coming out of the blue when I've tried all these grand things? And <laughs> all of a sudden now, for the first time, you're approaching me telling me that I'm not going to go to school. And he, she then told me that, no, you're going to go visit your great-grandfather um, in Cape Town. First time in Cape Town. Well, that I remember. And that's when I thought to myself, this guy is a pretty important person for me to be able to miss two days of school. <laughs> so, um, so as a kid, that, those were the two anecdotes. And I think growing up, when you're, constantly, when you're constantly engaged with different communities, as remote as they may be, or as, un as seemingly disconnected as they may be, and people know who he is, that it always hits me. And you think you get it, and then there's always an experience that is like, wow, okay, I, I still don't get it. So from, from that perspective, I don't think I'll ever um, get, because with each interaction that you have with someone, they have a personal story and a personal connection as to how he impacted them. So I'm always learning something new about the, the person he is and what they connect with when they, when they engage with his legacy. Okay. Talk a little bit about the Nelson Mandela Foundation and the Mandela Memory Center in their work. The uh, Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, uh, which used to be the Nelson Mandela Foundation, which he had set up as his philanthropic wing. So he has the Nelson Mandela Foundation, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, and the Rhodes Scholarship. And the Center of Memory has since like um, Dr. Ballard was saying, has since transitioned now to preserving his memory and his legacy. So there's a lot of archives and a lot of material that he's either engaged with personally, gifts that were handed over to him. Um, and it's now a, a space that allows for discourse and engagement around his legacy. Something that is con that continues, and in fact, I was in a conversation with um, the the now CEO, Mr. Selo Khatang, and um, what they're looking for and looking to engage is a lot of youth platforms. So youth engagement and starting to engage with 
um, younger people using the platform and the legacy as an opportunity for them to engage with a variety of different topics and, um, and issues that they believe are important. In, an engagement in a platform that, was a, that had been availed since it was the foundation was and still is the Nelson Mandela Lecture Series which generally they invite a, a guest speaker to, to touch on a number of different topics. This year's guest speaker was Mr. Mo Ibrahim, who is a successful African businessman and who recently started the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and also um, designed the Mo Ibrahim, the, yeah, the Mo Ibrahim Index. And it's a measurement on governance and um, leadership in Africa specifically with uh, presidencies uh, and state leaders around, around the continent. And we, a number of us, were picked as panelists to engage on social, and social, social cohesion and active citizen, citizenship, which is, again, a, an avenue for young people to start getting involved and putting their hands up and saying, well, this is what I think about the topic. Uh, here are my thoughts and engaging with, um, it's an intergenerational engagement to say, well, this is what, you all did when you were in office and what you were doing, and this is what we're interested in. How do we meet in the middle, and how do we get an effective use of your insights and your wisdom and our understanding of a variety of different things, technology, um, the circumstance that we are facing, and I mean, I think Twitter's uh, quickly becoming a, a tool set that our young generation uses to communicate with one another and publicize a lot of the things that we're doing. And that's a powerful tool that I think not many people in the older generation are familiar with or comfortable with using. So it becomes a platform to say in a variety of different issues and a variety of different principles that the Nelson Mandela Foundation, sorry, the Center of Memory holds dear, how do you engage those topics and allow, I mean, I was also very surprised when I saw that my great grandfather has a Twitter handle. So <laughs> <laughs> that's also the, the efforts of making that legacy engageable so they will, it's at Nelson Mandela and they generally tweet a number of different quotes that he uses. So it's all an, an effort of making, keeping the legacy alive and keeping it um, in a space where a lot of people can engage with it from a variety of, of different communities. Okay, I have one last question then we're gonna open it up to questions and answers from the audience. Uh, and we have a, a, a some amount of time for that but, uh, you have a lot of students that you got to have brunch with today, and a number of them are here uh, this afternoon. What should young Americans learn from Nelson Mandela? Hmm. From him specifically? <laughs> well, from his life and from what um, he accomplished and from what he went through. Determination. Um, He has a very sincere generosity, which is generally um, generally engaged when people see his smile and an appreciation and love of the youth and young people. I think from, from that perspective, if you can be determined and stand up for what you believe in and seek out the counsel of your peers and other people who have done better, I mean, he was very well, he is very wide read and even in his older age he would always joke about going for his um, masters in law and it, you never stop learning you never stop studying and you never stop trying to be better at what you're perceived to be good at so determination in that perspective um, being able to stand up for what you believe in and engaging other people and always trying to grow what your base of, of what you're good at he really made a difference, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, we're going to open up the Q&A. If you have a question, raise your hand. One of our students with a cordless mic will come by. Oh, sorry. While the, are they looking um, yeah. for the question? I think another thing is a, a comment he's also made is, uh, as Americans, you're, the rest of the world ex consumes your culture and your pop culture. And it's critically important for the American community to also be as well versed in other cultures. So for anyone that's about to travel, make sure that you get a quick facts book about where you're going 
so that you can engage with the community that's there and m not make any faux pas that you, you could otherwise avoid because that sometimes um, creates an immediate, I know so much about you, why is it that you're not at all interested about who I am yet you're coming to my home? So I think from that perspective, it's very important for young Americans to make sure that they learn something about the communities that they're going to visit and it will make your experience a whole lot better and a, a, a lot more um, enjoyable. So I think that's also something that he, he would have spoken to. Great advice. Okay, we have our first question here. Yeah, wonderful to have you here. Uh, Coffee Boy is now a staple of reading in many high schools in the United States. Um, Mark Mathabane's accounts of growing up in the 60s in South Africa, how would you compare your experience several decades later? Is there similarities? differences? What happened during those two ensuing decades? Very interesting that you mentioned that book because he came to speak at St. Anne's and I remember being partially angry that that's the story that he was telling while I was sitting there as a grade 11 St. Anne's student because my personal experience, I didn't necessarily have um, what is covered in the material of Gaffer Boy, but now in being older and I hope a little wiser, I understand the importance of telling that story and the, the living experience. So Kafar Boy speaks about uh, growing up in the township and I believe he's from Alexandra specifically, which is a township that is on the outs, not even on the outskirts. There's a road called Louis Botha that on one side it's Santon and on the other side it's Alex. And the um, living conditions are completely different. So for myself, personally, didn't grow up with a lot of the material that's covered in Gaffer Boy, but I personally know people who've gone through that. Um, for example, the difference between college experiences and about as immediate as my mother. My mother um, went to university at the University of Cape Town, and while she was there, she was excited as a first year that she had her own room. And I mean, all of her peers were sharing, and constantly telling people about I have my own room and finally a friend of hers goes to visit only to find out that they had put her in a closet and that's an experience of someone I mean that's a parent of mine an experience that she had gone through and she was also by mere fact that she had gotten into UCT University of Cape Town and was studying there she's considered all privileged but her experience within the UCT environment was also one of um, oppression and then equally, one of the main reasons that I'm very passionate about trying to use education as a platform to get kids out of the township environment and give them a global perspective is one of the main reasons that leads to, unfortunately, the xenophobic attacks that we had recently is that space of I don't have much and there are foreigners coming into my space and doing better than I, I am. And it's <coughs> what generally, um, is missed in all of that engagement is that those people have worked hard to, to get and achieve what they've, they've gotten and that engaging them as how do I learn from you rather than being upset um, is, is a better, is a better um, response than the xenophobic attacks that have happened. And that, those happen also by way of apartheid creating a system in such that people feel that they cannot feed their families and it's very frustrating to them and clearly an, an not advisable reaction, but very frustrating to see someone else come from a foreign space and able to do much better than they're doing. So Gaffer Boy tells a very important story and uh, it very relays a very important and um, unfortunately still current reality of some people who are growing up in the township and rural communities and are trying to get themselves up and able to feed and support their families. And it's something that me and a lot of my friends and peers are saying, well, how do we use a number of the things that we've learned from the corporate environment and start applying them to the um, social space, which is um, why I, I, I like, I was once introduced as a phil phil philanthropist and uh, I watched the clip on YouTube and my face changed before anything actually came out of my mouth, but more so because I joke about it and say, well, philanthropists have money and I have none. So there's no way that I'm a philanthropist, but what is growing in South Africa is the space of social entrepreneurship. So being an, um, an entrepreneur and also having a social outlook in a lot of the work that you do 
which is why I got involved in, in starting Yatumzi Advisory and looking to say, with the corporates, you have a mandate anyway to spend on CSR and CSI. I can help you engage with the communities, make it sustainable, and make it um, grow your potential impact that you'd otherwise not get if you work on a single touch point. So my personal growing up, um, I, it may have been skewed by the fact that I have the last name that I have, but I wouldn't say that I'd, I'd, be, I'd be lying if I said I had the same experience as what's covered in Gafford Boyd, but I'm very aware of a lot of people that do. That's it. Okay, I have a question back here. Well, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak today. We really appreciate it. Um, looking at the current state of affairs, what do you see as the biggest obstacle to South Africa's growth, and what do you think should be done to overcome it? Okay, uh, the biggest obstacle to our growth is unequal schooling systems. And I think in any community, in order to, for it to grow, you have to have a mechanism of dispensing a high level of education to as many people as you can. Because the more critical thought that you have from your general populace, the better the solutions are because they'll be interrogated at a variety of different levels before they're approved. I think um, as a developing nation, sometimes you feel like you're in a certain sense of ur um, urgency and things you f some, sometimes feel that you have to have immediate impact. But in hindsight, at least my personal um, learnings would be we, going forward, we cannot afford to be seen to be doing things just for the sake of doing things, but we actually need to start engaging and saying, well, how can we do this in a realistic, sustainable, and manageable way? And how can we critique a lot of the solutions that are being put forward and make sure once they get to implementation, we're spending time rolling them out rather than rolling a half, um, a, a piecemeal s solution only to spend the balance of the time trying to fix what we had done wrong just because we didn't spend as much time as we should have engaging the solution. And I think that's, that's easier said than done with me sitting here, not holding office and not having to communicate with uh, communities that are saying, well, we still need what it is that we need. But I do think it's something that's important that needs to be brought in. And the only way that you can do that is by making sure that people in the general community and the citizenship is very well educated so that they can, they can critique and themselves can see when a politician is talking, um, talking the talk and not in any position to implement a lot of the things that they're, that they're um, saying that they can do. And I think once everyone is able to think critically and think for themselves and make their own minds up, will be a long way of um, getting away from emotional politics rather than getting people and being able to hold people accountable. Okay, do we have a question back here? Uh, my name is uh, Robert Kuganable. I'm from Ghana. I'm visiting the KU Community Work Group. I'm just wondering whether your discussions with him, he talks about Africa in general. He would by, um, by way of sharing travel. And I think one thing that's very interesting in how we engage with our grand great grandfather is that when he was at home, it was never, I'm Nelson Mandela, global leader, hear what I have to say. It was engaging with your great grandfather. So he'd be asking you about school. So how are you doing at school? Um, what are you doing? What are you studying? And how, what does that look like when you graduate? And how are you going to use that going forward? Um, it was never a, well, the agenda topic today is this, and this is how it's going to roll out. It was more of conversations happened organically. I think by virtue of him being uh, married to a Mozambican, there was a lot of conversation about the history of Mozambique. And I think he would share stories as an anecdotes about um, being an MK, Mkonto um, Esizo, um, which was the militant wing of the ANC, and being trained in exile. So he'd speak about it in terms of how much assistance the liberation movement as um, the ANC would get from leaders of other African nations and what great role they played in putting pressure 
on South Africa, but it was never on a um, model UN space of saying, what do you know about this country and um, can you list its, its historical facts, but rather this is how, um, this is why my relationship with President Gawunda is as strong as it is because you did this, that, and the other. And um, it's always speaking about leaders in general, but not from a policy and government perspective. It was more as an old man engaging with his, his <coughs> younger generation and his family. We have a question here. One thing that I associate with Nelson Mandela is his promoting the truth and reconciliation work. Seems to me that was a stroke of genius or inspiration or something. Can you give us a story of how that came to be? I used to think the truth and reconciliation um, was happening, I was probably seven or eight. <laughs> and as a kid, I used to always be frustrated when my mother would tune in because I'd want to watch sports and cartoons. Um, but it, I mean, in, in hindsight, looking at it, it was, there's a lot of criticism, both in terms of saying it, it allowed for a platform to, for people who were involved in what was going on in apartheid to voice what they saw as the people who had been um, done wrong by, by the counterparts. So it was a, a space for healing. And from that perspective, it was great because it allowed for a lot of people to engage a platform of saying, hi, I'm Johan, and this is what I did to your family, and this is why a particular family member is missing. The unfortunate side of it, which is also sometimes a, a criticism of, of the, tr the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, is that you would always be engaging people who were carrying out orders. And some people generally feel like it should have been a platform that allows for people who were giving the orders to engage with the families that they affected. So from at an, an initial, and that's something we as South Africans do quite a lot of. Um, people will celebrate our achievements, but we always take a step back and say, well, okay, how could we have done it better? And I think that's a lot of the conversation that's coming from the younger generation and some people who themselves were saying it didn't go far enough. Um, but it definitely did from a perspective and it's something that my great grandfather's generation holds very dear is the power of forgiveness and the power of letting go of that heavy weight. And that is something that it achieved for the people who are intimately involved with the TRC but as is the case in anything that you try and do on a national basis, not everyone gets to participate and engage that platform. So I feel like um, personally, from that perspective, it would be interesting to engage with the people who came up with it and some people who had been on that platform and see how to continue. Because there, there are some people who still feel like they, they walk around with open wounds from apartheid and they've not had a, a, a space to, to heal and engage that space. And I'd be interested in finding out, well, how can that be done and how can that be taken for forward and continued? Alternatively, um, what can be done better? I hope that answers your question. Okay, we have a question back here. Um, I'd like to say thank you for coming. Um, You're welcome. Uh, you've taught me so much history that I, we, think of ourselves as being very educated, but I think especially when it comes to Africa, we have a lot to learn. Uh, it was really nice to meet you. Um, I have a question about micro loan banks and whether that you think that's, is that something people are doing already or something that would be good to have? Thank you. I'm personally, so, just to put my response in context, I majored in philosophy, so math is not my field. <laughs> but um, microfinancing is something that has been engaged in a number of um, sub-Saharan um, countries in South Africa, but, sorry, on, in, in, South, in Africa. But something that's been engaged in South Africa as part of the broad-based black economic empowerment um, legislation is enterprise development, which is one of those seven pillars. And what they do through enterprise development is saying, here's a, someone who stood up and said, I want to be an entrepreneur and this is the business that I'm looking to run. And corporates can then donate up to 3% of their net profit after tax in helping those organizations get up and running. 
And this is, one, this is part of the work that I'm working on in saying, well, make sure that you're, so some of the industries themselves and the sectors that operate within South Africa have um, what they call sector, so there's the general charter and then the sector specific charters that speak to how they'd like to engage. So um, environments like construction mandate that the, the give back that they, those the corporates do, that 3% has to be engaging people within that industry to make sure that there's also mentoring and running um, other environments like manufacturing um, and the textiles just allow for any and every donation to whomever is in the space of, of being in that space, um, of being in that industry. So what is happening that I can speak to in South Africa specifically is the enterprise development industry is growing. And in, f in fact, they've now in conversation of linking it up of, with one of the other one of the other elements that it's measured against, which is preferential procurement. So basically, as the Doe Institute, where do you buy your chairs from? Who does your lighting? Who are your photographers? Who do you hire? And it's making sure that in doing that, you've, you're conscious of saying, well, yes, I could hire a photographer that's great at it, but is he either, he or she transform themselves as an organization? Or can I find a black-owned, black-run organization that I could bring in and give business um, to? So. I think from that perspective, it would be comparable to microfinancing, but I think it also takes on the transformation agenda that South Africa has specifically. Okay, I have a question here. A long time ago, I think 33 years ago, my, I had an anthropologist husband and a three-year-old little girl, and we flew off to Joburg, stayed there for a month, and ended up going down to live in a mud hut in Pete Singh, the Sutu. It was such a shock to be confronted with apartheid. I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to hear how things have changed. Uh, I would be curious. Uh, we did. Um, I had been on the. I have been on the edge. Stood on the edge of the campus of the University of Fatwatersrand and been to Durban several times. You have a beautiful country. Thank you. I would be curious, has, I would hope that Lesotho has followed your directions as far as apartheid. Uh, do you happen to know? I unfortunately don't. I do have a friend that is from Lesotho, in fact, two, well, one friend and one um, acquaintance, uh, an associate through work, and they're both from Lesotho, and they, they do, actually I have more. Hmm. Um, so three people that I engage with quite often that are doing a lot of cross nat they work in South Africa, and a lot of this, the work that they're doing, they try to bring back home. So for example, um, we, ha we recently had a corporate basketball league so for all of us um, people that are now working and still think we can put up some shots, we get together and play uh, against one another. And he had taken his team back home to Lesotho to, um, as inspiration and his give back to his community. Um, there's a gentleman who's the editor-in-chief of um, Destiny magazine, and he's from Lesotho. And there's a, personally, my, our coach for our team is from Lesotho. And, in the program that I'm trying to do with Skew Circle. He's already engaged in saying, how can we, uh, once the organization is up and running, then take the learnings that we have and transplant them to Lesotho. But in terms of how is it right now, I honestly don't know. Personally, okay. yeah. I have a question back here. Hey, Ms. Lorraine. Um, I'm aware that the ANC archives is at the University of Connecticut. And with this new center, Memory Center, I wonder if there's any initiative or any consideration to get that archive back to South Africa. I think it's something that um, KU could engage with Vern, Vern Harris, who's the head of archives at the, um, at the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory. But I personally am not aware of anything uh, of that nature that is currently engaged. But I. I do think it, it would be open for conversation and saying, um, I mean, Kansas University got their rules back, so I think it would be a nice, <laughs> a nice way. <laughs> okay, we have a question right here. 
Yes, thank you for coming to KU. Um, I want to talk about the time that Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. Yes. I've been to Robbins Island. I visited the site where he was imprisoned, even the cell in which he was incarcerated. I want to know if there is any information about the kinds of day-to-day uh, -day communications in which he was allowed to engage, especially with the outside world. Um, I wanted to know if there were any communications allowed or were there restrictions on the amount of contact with the outside world through communication? There definitely were restrictions. Um, I think one of the things that made him gravitate towards reading the letters for his um, officer was just any contact with the outside world and learning anything that was going on. So by reading those letters, he would gain insight as to what the family was telling um, the person he was reading it for. One, one example of how limited the information that he would get from the outside word, world was when my grandfather had passed away. His eldest son passed away when my mother was 18 months old. He was not allowed finding out that his son had passed away, couldn't communicate with any of the family, and also was in a space where he couldn't lay him to rest and could only find that out, I think, I want to say six or so months later. And he actually speaks to that in conversations with myself in terms of the pain of a parent not being a, well, first of all, the pain of a parent losing a child and then compounded by the pain of a parent not being there to lay their child to rest and pay the final respects. So from that perspective, that goes to show the extent of how limited the information was and the interaction and communication with the outside world. Okay. Somebody had a hand up right here and then we have one over here. We'll do this one first, oh, I guess. Um, many sub-Saharan African countries um, have undergone, oh, I'm over oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> um, have undergone significant economic difficulties with extreme poverty or possible political corruption. What's special about South Africa that's enabled it to largely avoid political corruption and the extreme depths of poverty, even though I'm aware that they still do exist there? Yeah. Um, I think it's one of the things that's, that's celebrated about the, the negotiation space and the negotiation environment is that because there was no outright war in South Africa, we were able to keep a lot of the infrastructure and we didn't have the, the recourse of the international community disinvesting completely and disconnecting with South Africa completely because of the, the business risk perspective of there being turmoil in a country. So from that perspective, it's allowed us from transition and continuing over the um, previous 19 years to continue from a business perspective with foreign direct investment and being an environment that's friendly to foreign direct investment from that perspective. I think from a corruption perspective, it's, like you said, it's not something that we are, um, that it exists in South Africa. And one thing that we do have is a very expressive media and a very, very expressive citizenship that highlights whenever corruption is going on. So I think that's a, a very important tool that is used and make sure that you hold people accountable. I do, however, believe that sometimes it, it's also equally good to tell the good stories in as much as you tell the bad stories. So it's, an, it's very important to be objective in how you um, relay information about a country as the media, but it's also important to tell um, the fact that in terms of South Africa, we've had the the highest percentage rollout of infrastructure development since our democratization. And stories like that that we generally never get to, to hear because we're, um, to some extent, uh, the term that keeps coming to mind is inundated, but I wouldn't go as far as inundated, but we're, we're pounded with a lot of um, media that speaks about the, the work that is um, in the corruption environment. And we have an expressive um, political environment in terms of the opposition parties and what they speak about. And they're also out there uh, making sure that people are aware that certain things that should be getting done um, aren't. And they, they are very vocal and outspoken about that. So I'd say from that perspective, it's the, the active nature of the media coupled with some of the people in the pol political environment and just South Africans in general. I think we're 
a loud mouth community. So <laughs> it's very hard to silence us. Do we have a question here? Thank you. I think you're a very well-spoken, impressive young man who's a great ambassador for your country. Thank you. I um, know in the past, while many of us often associate with South Africa, the diamond mining industry, and in the past, the history has been very contentious. I wondered what the current status is. Huh. The d it's... It's um, so a lot of our mining and spanning. A, a, I'd like to answer your question by speaking about the mining industry in general because I specifically um, haven't engaged with diamonds in particular, but just to have had some access to media and information about the mining industry. What generally happens in mining, construction, and a lot of the um, blue collar work environments is that you have the union environment versus the actual corporate space. And one environment that, one incident in particular <coughs> where that has exploded is with the Lonman Mines where a lot of the people that were in the union and trying to strike and protest against their poor pay versus the, the corporate that was um, the employer ended unfortunately in a number of people losing their lives by panic or whatever the, you may call it from the police officers that were on the ground. So there was an unfortunate conflict that led to people losing their lives. I think from, from that perspective, that still continues where a lot of the corporations are making a lot of profit and the workers um, are seen to be, um, are in fact, excuse me, are their earnings are below um, acceptable standards and the unions are in constant conflict in a back and forth environment in terms of trying to negotiate on behalf of the work, workers and the corporates trying to negotiate on behalf of the uh, shareholders. So in general, both, both sides of the fence are representing stakeholders, shareholders on one side and the workers on the other side that will never speak the same language. Um, shareholders want to make as much profit as they want to have and that's why they invest in the corporations they invest in. Um, the people who run the unions have a membership that unfortunately by virtue of them being part of a union is more often than not exploited and they want to make sure that the, the work environment that they are in um, is in such a way where that wealth is distributed as, as much as possible. So that, that still continues and I, I hope that speaks to what you were asking. Um, that, that is something that recently came up in the One Young World Summit in the segment that they had, which was Knowing Mandela. And they spoke about the at face value, the jarring um, contradiction of there being a, role, a Nelson Mandela Road Scholarship Fund, given that history in terms of what my great-grandfather stood for versus what you're expressing right now in terms of how the Rhodes family and um, what, the, what is seen to be the Rhodes legacy. And I think the effort of combining the two and creating a scholarship that uh, primarily educates um, black South Africans is one effort and one avenue of trying to redress that um, those opposites and trying to merge it in such a way where some of the funds are now being used towards empowering people who are excelling in the education environment and giving them an opportunity and a vehicle to do better. And I think the more, like I was explaining in the, or answering in the question before, the more people that are educated, the better we can um, have manpower that deals with a lot of the topics that you're, you're raising in terms of people having being in a situation where they really don't have versus others having and how do we get them speaking a common language because what generally happens as I was saying you have the corporates that represent shareholders and the union leaders that represent the workers and if you consistently communicating on the advice of I'm a union and you're a corporate you're never going to speak the same language and I think it's important for young South Africans and young people around the world to try find a language where they can start speaking to each other because right now it's a matter of speaking at each other and it generally is a shouting match where 
some of the union leaders then feel, well, they're not being heard and we're gonna put tools down and we're gonna uh, protest and that then hurts the shareholders and immediate reflex is then to um, disinvest in the country, which we all don't want, but how do we get it in such a way where it's a sustainable engagement and a worthwhile back and forth in terms of negotiation and saying how do we bring the two extremes closer to the middle and in such a way that they can communicate with one another because that's obviously not happening with the types of um, stances that are taken back home. Do we have time for one or two more questions? I think we had one right here. Um, Actually, we have a few oh. left. We'll try to get to them. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, you demonstrate a lot of fine qualities. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, do you personally aspire to a political role within your country? <laughs> Good question. I, like that. <laughs> I wish I had asked that question. <laughs> I wish Bill had ended the question and answer with the previous one. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> um, not something I pursue actively. I think one of the things that makes politics a very tricky game is if you go into it having not achieved much in your own personal right. And I think if I later in life, I, I make this joke that I want two things to happen before I take on politics. The first of which is um, I saw a car drive by with diplomatic plates and I asked why are they different? And just the fact that you, you cannot stop a car that's got diplomatic plates I found quite awesome. So that's the first thing that I'd like to achieve. <laughs> um, so I'd love to be in a, in a space where I represent um, South Africa and try help unlock a lot of opportunities where um, I can f find other environments where there's things that we could benefit from and help them get help get them to South Africa, and in the meanwhile, get to drive around in a car that has awesome plates. <laughs> and then the other side of it is that I'd like to retire into politics when I've got not when I've got nothing to gain from the position, because I think sometimes, and it's something that we forget. Politicians are humans as well. So if I as my if I as Luvuyo went to school at Hamilton, and one of my classmates is an um, is a venture capitalist, the other one has started a business, and a lot of people are doing things where they're, they've got something to show from their efforts, and I'm having a hard time putting my kids through school because my salary isn't as great as I'd like it to be. Um, I'd love my kids to have the, as best an education as I can afford. And the more often that you're getting battered by those people that are saying, well, you, you've done this for 20, 15 years, and you may not have as much to show for it as you'd like, how about you pass this particular bill and um, then we've got something for you. I think generally um, corruption happens because we're all human beings. And I think when we engage the, the topic of corruption, we forget that. We expect politicians and people who hold office to be um, the most pristine human beings that don't have a space where they have families to take care of. And, as much of an impact as they'd like to have within their own personal space. So for me personally, I think it's something that I'd like to retire into, and I think there's a lot I can do with the flexibility of being a social entrepreneur and running smaller organizations, um, but nothing that I would pursue actively, no. Okay, we have a question back here, and then I saw a hand over, actually we have two hands over here. We'll get these last two, so Anne Renee, if you'll come over here, Joy. I think it's important to remember, my friend, that your uh, grandfather didn't actively pursue politics either. <laughs> um, but I wonder if you can speak at all about the preponderant position of, the, of uh, South Africa in the African Union um, and what your country can do to positively shape the continent um, through multilateral, bilateral um, diplomacy like that. Okay. Um, so first week that I got into the US, I was speaking at the Wilson Center, and a fellow a Hamiltonian stood up, and she's from Kenya. Um, and she said, well, you guys are South Africa, and then as much as everyone celebrates how well developed you are, uh, to a very serious and a very real extent, you're considered the Europe of Africa, so you don't really relate to many of the problems that we have in the rest of the continent. And I think for us as South Africans and engaging in a lot of those platforms, it's, it's for us to be quite honest about that. We benefit from a lot of the things that the rest of our neighbors didn't benefit from. And it's in being honest with that and starting to engage, well, what did that mean? What does that look like that we can start engaging in those bilateral um, exchanges in the African Union and being um, vocal about this? Yes, this is, again, it goes somewhat back to the conversation about cheese kids. 
yes, we've benefited from how our country transitioned from oppression to what it is today. Um, we acknowledge that, we take ownership of that, but how can we share our learnings in since operating and taking um, leadership positions within the government that we can then share best practices? And also, I think, so, uh, flying over um, to the U.S., I was sitting next to a Se Senegalese businessman um, who was speaking about that engage, that ca South Africa had sent over a delegation um, of businessmen and people in a variety of different industries that are saying, what can we learn from Senegal? How can we unlock a lot of spaces and how can we do business together? And I think through those, more of those platforms and more of that engagement, there can be a realistic partnership and engagement. And I think from another perspective in speaking about different languages, I'd say it's very important for South Africans and myself included to start learning how to speak French because the rest of our continent is a Francophone, um, predominantly Francophone speaking um, nations. And that goes a long way to brokering a lot of the deals. There's some things that you just cannot express in a language that you um, are translating in when you're speaking and engaging one another. I think from, from our perspective, it's we speak the variety of the 11 different languages from back home. And when we speak in English, we're sometimes translating. Uh, well, for the older generation, I grew up speaking English. So sometimes translating in some of the um, negotiations that are happening. And likewise, for the people in the Francophone nations, they're having to translate from their, their um, native tongue to French and then into English. So that also is a lot of the nuances of that are lost in some of the things that they're trying to engage and um, make a reality. And I think it's important for us as South Africans, if we're looking to take that leadership role, is to making a very concerted effort in doing an exchange. So I speak about you circle possibly getting students to the US. I'd love to see a lot of um, exchange with other students within the continent. And it takes us learning, well, being there for a number of years saying, oh, okay, so this is um, Senegalese culture and this is what it means, this is what it means to do business in Ghana. Um, and simple things like, I don't know, standing up. Um, one thing that I noticed that I was having dinner with some people from Ivory Coast. No one sat down until the whole party was ready to sit down. And it's simple things like that that could make or break a, an opportunity where you're thinking, I have this great opportunity, this great idea that I have um, that could help your nation. But because you accidentally disrespected them by sitting down before the whole party was ready to be seated, that you, you might as well have said, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'll hop on my plane and go back home. So it's small things like that that we'll never learn unless we immerse in one another's cultures and get to learn who the human being behind the title or the position and what is on the other side of the table. Who is that person and how do I learn about them and realistically start engaging um, with those opportunities. Okay, we have time for two questions. We have this gentleman right here. Oh, she's not moving. Okay. Oh, I see you, Lubuyo. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to draw you to uh, what is happening in some parts of South Africa. Uh, you know, there is a town not far from Pretoria, uh, I refer to, yeah, thank you, uh, called uh, Klein Fountain. Mm -hmm. uh, see, your great grandfather has tried to create a rainbow nation, and that has been very good. Uh, but here is this town that has fenced itself off uh, from other South Africans. And as part of its core values, uh, you have to be uh, an Africana or descendant of that. You have to be able to speak Africans. And then, of course, uh, you have to be a Christian. Specifically, you have to belong to the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, on the gate, the entrance to the town uh, is the statue of uh, Henrik Verwood, uh, the father, some say, of apartheid. And no non-white, I'm quoting no non-white, still using that term, uh, and Jews are allowed in that, in that town. And you have to write, uh, send in a contract, and then you have to be interviewed by the community. 
to be admitted. So this is a town that is setting itself up in its own group areas. We know the group areas are mm -hmm. force people into areas that they didn't want to go. But here is this town now that is refusing to admit others in this rainbow nation. And South African, South Africa has 11 official languages. So what is the government doing about this town and some other uh, client fountains that may uh, exist in South Africa? Okay, thank you. Um, personally, I, I am aware of a number of different um, instances. So recently there was a group called Red, Red October and they are of that mindset. Um, they're the Afrikaans community and they've gone as far as saying there's a white genocide that's happening in South Africa. And honestly speak, so from a government perspective, I'm not particularly aware as to how they engage. And from a personal perspective, I don't know how you deal with people like that because that's, that is a very extreme sense of irrationality that how do you function as an island? I mean, we're in a global community. So how, how do you engage with someone that's unwilling to speak to you if you phenotypically look different? You know, I mean, in everyone that I've met today, you start off a conversation by greeting, greeting and shaking hands. So if I'm walking up to someone from that community and I reach out to shake their hands and they're unwilling to give me that gesture of acknowledgement, how do you start having a conversation with someone like that? That's to the extent of, well, the community is welcoming of you. Um, I think, I, I, honestly speaking, I don't know. I, I don't know how you would engage that. Um, it's gonna take a very long time and these become the benefits of things like technology. So if the kids in that community um, have access to technologies and start seeing that actually the world is not as polarized as my parents are making it look. And that's, that's all we can hope for is to engage with the younger generation, the future of those communities. But to engage with the parents is almost a lost cause because they're unwilling, like you say, you have to write an application to be able to speak to them. Um, South Africa has 51 million people that we are having to attend to. So if you're saying as a community, and again, it's within your democratic right as a democracy that we are, if you're deciding I don't want to participate in what is considered greater South Africa, they're within their right. I think it will become a problem if they start exercising their um, polar perspective in such a way where they start negatively affecting other communities. But in as much as when they say we want to be isolated, there's very little you can do about that. There can be recourse about them deciding to take action in terms of saying, well, that person walked five kilometers um, close to our borders instead of 5.1 uh, kilometers, so we're gonna kill them. That becomes a different story and you can act on that. But unfortunately, I, I don't know what the answer to that would be and it's, it becomes a waiting game. Um, some of those communities, you hope that someone, slowly but surely, you're gonna have people who um, leave that type of space and that type of environment and you hope that they can leave and then hopefully come back and change minds. It's nothing that you can do from the outside and it's something that has to come from inside that community and we can only hope that enough of their younger people can leave and go back. For example, the company that I worked at at Mira that works in the broad-based black economic affirmative action um, auditing, one of the girls comes from a smaller community called Clackstrop. She, her parents are the only ones that know what she does because she's an African speaking young um, South African girl who's working in affirmative action that looks at putting black people into better positions and auditing companies and seeing how transformed they are. And it takes someone like that coming from that small community going back and saying, mom, dad, this is what I do for a living. And the parents accepting and slowly the parents then have a conversation with the rest of their community and it keeps on growing in that way. But if you don't have anyone leaving that community to go back in, then it's, it's I don't know. Okay, we have one last question. Um, I'm Eileen, I'm from the northeastern part of the Eastern Cape, Mulwaney. Hi. Um, I just have a small t um, story to tell about your great-grandfather. My uncle was a warden at Robben Island okay. whilst your great-grandfather was there. 
And he was a sufferer of really, really progressive cancer, and he passed away in 97. And um, Madiba then sent a personally written letter to his wife to say that he's sorry to hear about George's passing. So I think that's sort of a nice way to, to illustrate the type of person that your great-grandfather was, is, Thank you. And, um, and how his extent of forgiveness. And it's just, I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I believe he'd also gone to meet with President Malan's wife, um, who was the president prior to Kate, um, F.W. de Klerk. And he had just had a tea with, with her, um, just basically saying, um, I guess, a, a gesture of an olive branch um, in, in, during his presidency. So that's also another one of those stories where uh, he not only spoke about forgiveness, it's something that he tried to live in as much as he possibly could. Mm -hmm. Abu, thank you so much for coming today. We you. really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming out. Hope to see you Wednesday night. We'll talk about Richard Ben Kramer and his work in uh, political journalism.